This past week, after six months of hurt and eight doses of chemical therapy, the surgeon entered the deliberations, determining that the Whipple procedure for removing the cancerous tumor plaguing my pancreas is finally ready to proceed. This Thursday, March 7th, 2024, bright and early in the morning, through some time in the afternoon, robotic instruments masterfully guided by sure and steady human hands will have their way with my innards separating embryonically conjoined organs, removing offending parts plus some good bits to be sure and reassembling what remains into a somewhat lesser, but hopefully equally functioning whole. The before and after of this moment are palpably present as I already see myself on both sides of the event horizon. Close your eyes and count down from 10. Weeks and months of physical, mental, and spiritual preparations are about to come to fruition. Complementary procedures, medicines and supplements, life-giving foods, long walks, push-ups, hot yoga, mineral springs, meditation, prayer, playing the wooden flute, giving myself time to heal. The unyielding support of family and friends, both new and old, the kindness and compassion of strangers, the presence of angels and the loving hand of the divine. All of this and so much more have carried me through a seemingly dark tunnel, orienting me towards a light shining ever brightly before me. Nine, eight. Coming to in confusion and pain, tubes tethering myself to gadgets, busily humming and beeping away, my eyes beginning to focus and rest upon Julieta's, then the boys, and whosoever shall be present in person and in spirit. To this man I send courage and strength. To all of you I send the immeasurable gratitude I feel in my heart. Thank you. I'll reach out again from the other side. Well, hello, howdy, Mikowski. <laughs> it's Again, a real pleasure to meet you. Um, this is our first time talking. And uh, look, you've been instrumental uh, in my research into this old world business uh, since the start. And your book really is what propelled me into um, digging a lot deeper. That's when the 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 veil really started to um pull back in terms of my own understanding of things i had um i had you know i have an architecture degree i've been practicing architecture for 20 years or so and 20 years ago in uh, in my architecture history classes i was studying the chicago world's fair and i was fascinated by it and I had loads of questions. I just didn't have a broader context to put it in. Um, and then when, you know, the whole YouTube phenomena of old world researchers, alternative history researchers started to become a thing. And I was absolutely just ripe and ready for it um, with questions that I had already been formulating on my own. And... And then again, your book appeared. I just, it was off to the races for me. And, you know, just the, just a simple discovery that it wasn't just Chicago, but it was all over the country and all over the world. And how come we didn't know about this? Um, it just absolutely fascinated me and captivated me. So all of that to say, it, again, it's an honor to actually sit down and talk to you. And uh, you reached out to me. Uh, I was pleasantly shocked to receive that email. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it came at uh, such an incredible time in my own uh, path, simply because I haven't been podcasting for the last four or five months. As you know, we just touched upon, I've been dealing with mm -hmm. pancreatic cancer. We don't have to get too much into that, but it's just sidelined me from doing this work and i'm about to head into a big surgery next week which is going to sideline me further so 
Howdy, this conversation will just, um, you know, it's, it's just a, um, in, to, in, to, to insert this into, um, you know, my process these last few months at this time, it's, uh, pretty incredible and, um, uh, really synchronous. And, um, I'm just happy to be here with you and, and get into what we're going to get into. Yeah. Thanks. And, you know, it was, um, because <clears throat> I, I think we are going to have a very interesting conversation for the people who are going to watch this. <clears throat> I think what we're going to do is we're going to begin with, and we're going to try to find depth. You know, th those of you who know us, you, you know our basic principles. So this is going to be a chance for us to go one level deeper with somebody who um, shares our kind of research. And the reason I reached out was, yeah, I watched the, the video you did. It was on the World Fair. It was on construction photos uh, mm -hmm. from maybe about six months ago. And it just showed uh, it just showed that you had a, had a great amount of, of background research, a great amount of understanding in this in the subject. Um, and, uh, you know, we're kind enough to mention um, my book, which is great because it's it's interesting that it's sort of like it kind of it was uh, talked about for about six months when it first came out. And then it's kind of like it's been forgotten by almost everybody. It seems like somehow they've all kind of just ignored it. And uh, which is, again, the way it kind of goes. But um it was it was a lot of work to write that book you know it was it was, a, it was a very and i could have kept going i mean it was nine months of writing it and i could have gone for another nine years and i just felt i've got enough now that i think i can get the ball rolling and part of my reason for writing it was that yeah maybe people like yourself would bump into it pick it up and say where can i take it from here how much deeper can i go i've just given you kind of like an idea from what i've found where can you go and, and like you say now it's the internet is flooded uh, with, I guess, what you would call alternative history research. And to me and to you, I think the World's Fairs are one of the most bizarre elements of our history that has no actual explanation for it, hmm. logically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually surprised to hear you say that it uh, was, that the book was you know, focused on for six months and then forgotten about, I guess, because I'm looking at it through my own lens and I've been referring back to it consistently ever since then, yeah. at least in my own, um, you know, edification in this whole uh, process. But it, it kind of makes sense at the same time, just because the whole YouTube thing and the social media thing, it's just on to the next thing. thing it's just on to the next. Right. So many of these, uh, you know, constructive criticism to the whole community is is that uh because of the nature of trying to get attention to videos and and podcasts i think there's a bit of a superficiality to the investigation and at least in my own research my own approach i'm trying to like you said go layers deeper and really right. look look closely look look at each building look you know look at it i've been saying you know through a forensics lens and let the story of the building emerge you know what is the what is forget the words forget the history forget what's written on paper what 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 are the buildings themselves trying to tell us what's their story and like you say the architects what are the arc what is the story of all the architects because those are also as nuts as the buildings they're all, they're all over the place yeah, there's pure fiction around the architects. Yeah, we can get into that. Um, I've done a whole yeah. deep dive into H.H. H. Richardson, which is its own big old rabbit hole. Um, I have a video, a couple of videos up on that. But yeah, let's start with the world fairs. Um, I like how you frame that, yeah. <clears throat> that it's it's just a, a an aspect, a major aspect of our history and our story of who we are, our narrative as a nation um, and our myth, our mythos that has no explanation. No. Yeah. No, I, like I say, when I came up, I was like you, I also came about the Columbian Exposition first. Uh, for those who don't know, I was, I was studying cathedrals in Florence at the time. I was down on Blue Holiday and was looking at the I was trying to see how the buildings functioned as as machines is really what I was doing so I had that in my mind buildings as machines ancient world as and when I came back I was just watching some YouTube videos and I came across one on the on the Columbian Exposition and I just it it was like and it wasn't so much that the 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 story of the fair being built it was that it's destroyed as soon as it's over 
Right. Now, supposedly, it, in the Chicago case, it was accidental fires, you know, which we can get into and show that obviously they, whatever happened there wasn't accidental. But once you began looking into these and you realize they put them up all over the world, right, built them in record times, and then as soon as they were done, brought in dynamite and blew them up. Mm-hmm. That was my indication that there's obviously something wrong with the story because you don't pump in what would be billions of dollars in today's income. Ha- you don't build the Olympics, mm-hmm. have the Olympics, and then as soon as it's over, blow everything up. Yeah, you you will find some way to use that whatever for something. So it told me right away that something was wrong. And then once I began studying what was what exactly was wrong with them, like then I, I shifted from like I say the buildings themselves to what was actually going supposed to be going on at these fairs. And that's where it just got crazy when I realized they're they're indoctrination machines. They're they're giant propaganda indoctrination machines for the population. And then I had to start wondering, well, what population are they even indoctrinating? Mm. Uh, and that's where the term I started using the term reset, which was kind of you know coming out in the alternative community. And then here we hit. Then we hit 2020 and all the insanity. And here's the word great reset being thrown at us. And I was like, oh crap, man! These right. these fairs are so important not just from the past, but for where we are right now. They're yeah, like literally a marker of what's going on right now. Exactly. And, and and again, this alternative research community has been using the term reset already. And then the great reset <laughs> suddenly appeared and was like, holy shit. Yeah. And you mentioned the, 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 the burning down the, uh, of the Chicago world's fair, um, Matt Terillion at the great deception podcast. He's the one that I did that video with that you referenced and he made the All point. Right, right. Yeah, he made the point that uh, that's a ritual, a, you know, burn, to to have the event and then to burn it to the ground is to ritually seal it into the consciousness of the population. Right. You know, in, in, and, up until and including what was also the interesting. Uh, I, I sorry, I had seen somewhere just right there. Just I, I saw some I mean, video somewhere recently. They were showing the the, the uh, images of the fire from the Chicago fair, mm-hmm. and again showing that most of them are fake. Most of them are pencil drawings. Most of them are, you know, they're they're composite images. They're not even real photographs. So we're back to what really happened there at all with this supposed fire. We don't even have real images. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and it's fascinating. Uh, again, you know, uh, Matt and I did, you know, we did a deep dive into the construction photos in that video and. Uh, it's, it's kind of maddening because you strain, you know, your eyes, you strain your credulity. And the point that I was making is I feel like I'm looking at the magician's wand and trying to figure out how he does his trick. You know, cause it's clear that a great number of those photos, uh, are manipulated. And if it's, if it's just one of one construction photo that was manipulated, you have to question the whole the whole lot of them and then the whole historical account like why would they do that and there's a lot of debunkers out there to say no look at this one photo that's real it's like well yeah but you know half of them aren't at least so you know that's to me it's like full stop now we have to investigate this why would they go through the trouble to manipulate a large percentage of them and make it appear that you know, these buildings were constructed at such a time and in such a way out of, you know, cardboard and plywood and plaster of Paris or staff. And um, and then we turn around and we have buildings like uh, the Parthenon building in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. That's as permanent as can be or the, you know, the, the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry that was the arts building. And the story behind that is so peculiar that, oh, it was it was built temporary, but the people liked it so much, they tore it down and rebuilt it out of marble and granite and copper. It's like, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, that's not how construction works. Having been in the industry pretty much my whole life, either as a designer or a builder, um, you don't just tear down a temporary building and build it as real because it again, it just it strains credulity. Um, and I, I find it puzzling that when people do get into this to a certain degree, that they're so willing to kind of take the off ramp 
And that's kind of what those stories are to me. It's like, here's an opportunity to just exit the, the riddle because it's too much. And so we latch on to things like that, you know, like, oh yeah, well it just, you know, they rebuilt it because it was, it was so popular, but you know, you go there and it's, just, it's, it, it's, it's a beautiful old world building um, that's, you know, should be marveled at in, in, a, in, a, in its own historic context And, you know, when I look Yeah. at, mm -hmm, when I look at buildings, Go like ahead. to make this point, it's, um, I, I tried again, look at it through a forensics lens. Like what's the story the building's telling. And part of the story is, you know, the materiality of it, the, the trades that went into it, the manufacturing capacity that would have been needed, the infrastructure that would have been necessary, you know, all of these components that have to come before the building can actually be put together. Um, we talk about, yeah, the foundations and sometimes, you know, we get into the, how deep these foundations are often, but just the ability to manufacture and transport um, such materials at such an early stage in our, uh, you know, in our, in our national, um, in our nation's uh, development, Uh, it suggests it really suggests a much earlier um, beginning of the built environment in this country. you know yeah you know what could be interesting as a i'm throwing this out as a possibility for you once you get through next week and you recover and you're back and ready to go in in a month few months or something given that you have something very special which is you have building technical knowledge which i don't have right i had to go and see building contractors and get their opinions you can you can have your own opinions based on mm -hmm. the, your own knowledge it could be interesting for you to think of writing whether it's a book or even just a series of articles in which you take one of the fairs and you can you uh, lay out exactly what it would take to build that today from mm -hmm. somebody coming to say i want you to build the st louis world's fair for me and then you would have the technical knowledge to be able to say this is the kind of planning that's required this is the kind of landscaping that's required this is the kind of machines that we need this is the amount of guys we need this is the amount of equipment i mean literally you could put down that if you were doing this in 2024 here's what we would need to do it just so that people can could get like an actual true understanding in their mind of what we're talking about here Mm -hmm. the the logistics of it is staggering mm -hmm. the amount just just the amount of wood you would need for scaffolding right even if let's say somebody says oh they're they're all old buildings and they're just they, they painted them the amount of wood you would need for the scaffolding just to do the painting is staggering just just that then you start adding the Where are the guys going to get their lunch from? Where are they going to eat it? Where are they going to go to the bathroom? Where are they going to, where's the sewage runoff going to be? Where's the, um, because that was one of the things the building contractors came to me right away when he looked at the photos, it was of the St. Louis fair. Cause it happens at the St. Louis fair has some really good const clear construction photos. And he was looking at them and he just said, well, where's the guy, where's the sandwich on the ground? Where's the sandwich wrapper on the ground from the guy that just ate? Where's the coffee cup from somebody who just drank his cup of coffee? He said, I've been on building sites my whole life. I can guarantee you nobody's been here for six or eight months. This is this is just deserted. This is not a building site at all. I don't know what this is. Yeah. And it's like little things like that, that somebody, you need somebody with your, like somebody expertise who's really done these kinds of projects, things that I wouldn't know, When I look at photographs, you know, and, yeah. and that could be something that down the road might be able to trigger some people who are on the fence to kind of start saying, well, that's what we would need today. How did they do that in the 1890s? Yeah. Where's the porta potties? Where's the food trucks? No, you're yeah. absolutely right. Um, and when you're talking about like the Chicago fair, again, it's, it's something like 40,000 workers. They cite, you know, all descending on the site day in and day out through Chicago winters, which really would have, you know, cut the work down significantly, you know, it would have compressed that two years, maybe into a year and a quarter or something. Um, but you can't just keep, and this is like the thing with the pyramids. Well, it's just, you know, they had so many slaves that they were able to do it in such a short amount of time. It's, you cannot keep throwing bodies at a project to explain away what we're seeing. 
you know, there's right. a, like you say, it's the, the logistics of it are just, you know, overwhelming. And at a certain point, I've been on plenty of job sites where there's just too many bodies and not enough direction. And more interestingly, the, these the, the Chicago Exposition was supposed to be open every Sunday for local people to go down and watch them work, right? This is one of the, the stories. Not once did anyone from any newspaper or anywhere decide to take a picture. Like, that would be a great photograph. Three or 4,000 people from the city hanging out, watching the men work. That's a, that's a photo op for the newspaper. We don't have one of those. So... All of the, every time you pull up a story with mm. these fairs, it just doesn't make any sense. And you're talking about, okay, so supposedly they have 40,000 workers needed, plus all of the logistics, plus all the everything. But there's no problem to also start building the University of Chicago right next door. It's no problem to build a new amphitheater. It's no problem. They just, mm. everything is being built all over at the same time in massive, perfect structure, kind of like, yeah, it's no problem building a world fair and something else and something else. It's like, the I, I guess it's just nobody until recently ever started like really honestly asking questions. Everybody just for whatever reason up to this point in time just believed the story right. because they didn't want to not believe it. Or it's just, you know, who has the expertise and, the you know, first of all, the curiosity, um, yeah. the drive, the expertise. Like there's a lot of things that have to kind of come together uh in, in to to get to the point of uh, plus the incredulity and you know all of this and to question the narrative at such an epic scale it's like i've been telling my wife about this stuff like for a while before i started my i almost had to start my own podcast because my wife is just like enough enough <laughs> like you, i had right. to give her a break and 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 talk to other people about it um but it's like well how do you know? And like, how come nobody else is asking these questions? And, and I don't know, I can't explain that how we've as as a, a nation gotten this far along without raising really fundamental questions, which when looked at the questions seem obvious, and the answers are impossible to arrive at. Right. Somehow, of course, as you might know, I, I'm I'm at the I'm of the belief that we're in a simulation and the simulation is ending. We're getting close to the end of this particular simulation. That's what the reset is. That mm -hmm. they're they're resetting us into a new simulation. Um, whether the world fairs were just a cleanup of this simulation or a new one, I, I don't know. But because I think we're getting to the end of this simulation itself it's not stable anymore because a lot of energy is already going to the new one. They're, they're building the new one as they're pretending to be dealing with this one. And I get the sense that a lot of things that might say were magically covered over, you might say for a long time, they're losing the cover. They're losing the cover. So as, as we go on year by year, more and more things can be seen through by anybody who wants to see through them because the, we'll call them the, the, the supposed magicians at the top are putting their focus on something else, not this anymore. And so it's all there to start being seen clearly. And it doesn't matter where we look in history. You know, we, like you say, we start, now we start moving into orphan trains. Now we start moving into insane asylums. Now we start moving into the civil war. Now we start moving into Custer's last stand. I mean, it doesn't matter what historical event now of the 1800s I look at, it's like almost instantly I can pick out the, well, that's not true. That's not a true narrative. That's a lie. That's, you know, and it's just like, well, the whole damn thing is probably bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like the whole thing we think of as history is that one complete gar piece of garbage. And I think the reason nobody has really dug into it is because of what that means. That's a scary principle to an average person because the foundation of everything a person is built on is certain things, right? It's my name, my parents, where I come from, uh, the history I've been told, science or religion, whatever that is for people. There's all of these foundations. And if any of them start to be shown as, hey, this might be, this might be false. Mm -hmm. Well, everything will start cracking under one's feet. What do they have to stand on? Most people are would rather stand on something false then actually pull all that stuff out because they know if they pull out one, we might start pulling them all out. And if we find, if I ever found out everything I've been told is false, now what? 
Yeah. And I think it's like a giant defense mechanism that for a long time has been in, in force. But because things are cracking now, it's um, let's just say foundations are shaking for everybody right now. And so they're willing to they're willing to ask questions they never asked before. Yeah. Um, yeah. It really does take a strong constitution to start this work and then once started to continue it. Because what you come up against sometimes is just, yeah, it can be, it can be overwhelming. Like just for instance, the, the yeah. fires, the great fires and just like the Chicago world's fair, where it was a one-off when presented historically, the, the, the urban fires of like the late 1800s, early 1900s were also presented as a one-off. You know, we had old Miss O'Leary and her cow and the lantern, and then, mm -hmm. you know, a, a matchstick shanty town city that was just waiting to go up and smoke and here i am in seattle and i turn around once i started scratching the surface on that one i realized whoa there's a great fire in seattle in 1889 not only that there was a great fire in spokane in 1889 and a great fire in ellensburg washington in 1889 three major cities in what was washington territory up until the summer of 1889 when these fires occurred and by the way there happened to be a convention for statehood where Washington was a holdout territory and suddenly three of its major cities, three of its major cities, business districts get incinerated within uh, two months of each other. And then, and then suddenly Washington's a state and that I, I realized yeah. that and I went, Whoa, like there's, <laughs> there's a lot more to this, but then there's this tendency to like kind of recoil from that and say like, um, can I, is it okay to say this out loud? <laughs> you know, and and it's because it can yeah. it can be incredible. And then and then you you know, and we don't have to get too far down this uh, road. But then things happen, like what happened in Lahaina, in Maui. And I did a whole video comparing and contrasting the fire in Seattle in 1889 with the fire in Lahaina. And yeah, um, so you really have to kind of uh, gird your loins. <laughs> And steal yourself and work, work, you know, work on your on developing your own uh, self as a person, as a human being, as a whole, as a whole uh, um, a human in, in, in everything that entails. Because once the veil is lifted and the foundation crumbles, you know what's left, and uh, where do we have to stand? And so it really takes yeah. knowing yourself. Very much so, like. Those again, those fires are such so strange, as you know from my from my book. The there 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 are all these photos that sometimes are taken of these cities when the fires are just starting or they're they're underway, and the people are just they're standing around like like it's a barbecue. Yeah, you know, it's like like the the ones of the of the of the San Francisco earthquake is the most famous. Like people are all sitting on chairs and like they're reading the newspapers. Like your city is burning. It's just been a massive earthquake and it's burning down. And all the people are just, they're in their nicest uh, Sunday clothes and they're reading the newspaper. I'm like, it's surreal. It, it just, it just looked extras on a movie set. Yeah. That's exactly what it looked like to me. And, and so, so again, that, because, because my, my last post, the thing I happened to do on my blog just before we were talking last week was all about, could the photographs, a lot of the photographs of the world fair has been photographs of dioramas of models. Is it possible that, and I'm not saying that that doesn't mean there wasn't a fair. There might have definitely been a fair, and there might have definitely been some big buildings, but it would also make it interesting if you had like one tenth the size of a fair, but you built uh, a complete size model and then took photos of the model, pretending you were taking photos of the whole thing. Now you begin to start questioning all of the photographs you're looking at. And and you could say, yeah, now we bring in actors. Now we bring in whatever to photograph scenes the way we want to film it. And and you are left standing there back at square one of like, well, what are we looking at? Like, what, what, and let, let, let me, ask, okay, let me ask you this question. This is like a fundamental question. Given all that now you've studied on the fairs over the years, your honest opinion now, what do you think is the reason they started having these fairs in the first place. Like, you know, the first one supposedly in London at the Crystal Palace in, in 1851. We know what they say they are. What do you think 
was the reason for even starting and having these fairs? I'm I just what, what your answer would be. Um, the further back you go, uh, the more interesting they do seem to get. Uh, you know, going back to the crystal palaces and what we what we see in a lot of those photos is this extraordinary technology that's being presented to the public. And right. so, um, I mean, you know, Tesla coiled towers and <laughs> Fresnel lenses and, you know, just the wonders of the world all being pulled together and put on display. So it does seem to me that there was a, a, a concerted effort to sort of um, curate the technology that had I, I can't I can't believe anymore that this technology all of a sudden sprang into existence at existence at that moment and was like, wow, right. look at what, you, what, what wow. we just invented. I think it was, you know, a, a collection of the greatest hits of technologies that existed and that were ready for reintroduction. That's what it seems to me. Right. The other thing, the other aspect of it, importantly, and this gets into the whole like human human zoo component, uh, where you know sample populations were brought from ex exotic places from all over the world and put on display in in pens, um, and it was an uh, an and, and a concerted effort to explain to this new population who they were by contrast that look how special you are you belong to these amazing buildings and this amazing architecture and this amazing technology and you're you know by contrast you're not that you know primitive thing you're part of this new civilization that is being groomed and um brought into reality whether it's um uh, what what did you say before you believe you, you think that this is a sim whether it's a simulation or not whether it's you know just an unfolding of history um either way right. i think in the same sense that you know disney which picked up in the in the in the era of animation and and cinema uh you know the most of the function of disney movies is to shape consciousness and explain uh, our, you know, explain our reality to the people, uh, and and in th through the lens of again the magician's wand, to mix a metaphor there. Um, I think that's I think that's largely what they were. As as mm -hmm. things moved forward, I really believe that it was it was there to shape consciousness and to uh, explain reality to, a, you know, I guess a very naive uh, and wide-eyed population that was, you know, one way or another, and for one reason or another, settling the land. Yeah, see, I think you gave some, some really interesting words there in your, in your statement. One was, you said, you thought it was the reintroduction of technology, which meant in order to reintroduce something, the population couldn't couldn't know what it was. So it's not like they the the population it was being it was because it's reintroduced. So the, so it, it's indicating a giant loss of memory of the population. Yet somehow whoever was there, it seems like they have no idea of what's going on or what was there before them. Like mm -hmm. the, like almost like they just literally dropped down from outer space, and this is like their first week on the planet. And then the other was talking about the human zoos, which of course are another just strange thing at these elements of these fairs was when you said um, it was a place where they could learn who they were by contrast. So that means it's an indication that well, then people don't know who they are mm. and we're back to, then that means they don't really have any memory of who they are. So do they not have memory because they, they've, they've moved from one location to another location? Do they not have memory because there's been some sort of traumatic event and they have literally been, you know, they're traumatized? Are they as crazy as it sounds? Or have they been like manufactured somewhere and like just sort of dropped, like I say, just kind of like dropped into the world? It's, 
it's so because I agree with you. I, I agree with your your statements almost at, when you when you look at some of the fair photos that we have that are somewhat genuine with the real people. Because a lot of for those of you who don't know, go look at some fair photographs. You'll notice a lot of the people are penciled in. They're not actually there's a photograph, but the people have been drawn in with pencil. But mm-hmm. there are some where it does seem to be they're real people there. They look lost. Mm-hmm. The people walking around look like they have no idea where they are and what's going on. Now, it'd be easy to say, well, the grandeur of the buildings, the grandeur of the site, it, you know, it's just like it's like your first day at Disneyland. You'd be like, wow, this is incredible. But it doesn't seem like that. It literally seems like they are like out to lunch. And and so it really makes me wonder um, who exactly were these populations and where are the numbers coming from? What did you say the, the, that was 27 million that attended the Chicago Exposition? I think that's the number, right? That's and the- okay, so you could, and the, the, the population of Chicago is what, was like 2 million at the time, 3 million? Yeah, something, something in those like a quarter or something of the entire population of the U.S. or a third. It's, it's yeah, right. So okay, so we could say, but we could say, well, that's that's entrances. So you could say, well, a lot of people they went more than once. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's say a lot of people went three or four or five times or whatever. But even if you say every single person on the twenty-seven million went three times, mm-hmm. that's still nine million people who went to the fair. That means every single person in Chicago and another 6 million from somewhere else, where did they come from? How did they get there? Where did they stay? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Chicago's just gone through a, a huge fire in 1871. Supposedly, a lot of the cities burned down. So what, these rich people from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are just sleeping on the street? You know, where are they sleeping? Again, all of these questions have to go through your mind as to, uh, and then, and and then why do they have passports? Why are they in? I think it started in 18, 19, 80, 97 or 99, where they started, have, particularly for children, they would have photographic passports, seemingly for people going to the fair. The, the amount of technology for 1899 that it would require to take a photograph at the gate, mm. turn it into a thing that somebody would wear, that's staggering. Mm-hmm. in its in its scope so we're all back to these questions of who really who really are at these fairs and do we really believe that 27 million really went to the chicago exposition i i can't believe that number if so then i don't know where they came from yeah 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 in our in our email exchange um we kind of arrived at this uh th- this idea that just looking at the fairs in isolation, it's maddening. It get, you get to the point where it's, you know, the questions are great and the answers are elusive at best. And so it can, it can drive you crazy um, because it's like, I don't know, like every, every stone you turn over, it's, I don't know. And I, I made the point that it can, they have to be looked at in the context of what was going on in the country. Like the Chicago world's fair, has to be looked at in the context of, like you said, the University of Chicago was being built at the same time, downtown buildings, the federal building, which is, you know, a mind boggling building all in in its own, was being built in Chicago at the same time. Um, And so if it looked at alongside uh, an urban uh, development that looks very much like it was already um, not just in progress, but already ex- existent, that these so many of these uh, buildings, you know, for instance, Chicago was not a matchstick city made out of, you know, clapboard and, and wood and just ready to, you know, burn down and that the first time a cow kicked a candle. It was, you know, and you, and you know this by looking at the, the photographs of the aftermaths of the, of the fires and you see over and over and over again masonry buildings of of brick and stone of an exquisite nature with granite and marble columns and you see it in city after city after city after these urban fires and so you begin to realize you know holy cow there was there was stone and brick masonry of an exquisite nature an advanced architecture uh, already here, already here. It was here in Seattle. 
you know, way out here in Seattle, you know, the, and not only that, um, in looking at the uh, photos of the uh, fire aftermath in Seattle, what I, what I've seen is masonry buildings that aren't just, you know, walls eight inches or a foot thick, but walls that are three feet thick. And I realized these buildings were built, I don't know when or by whom, but they were definitely built uh, with construction methods that we just don't use anymore. I just picked up in a in a in a um an antique store uh in the Columbia River Gorge, um between Oregon and Washington. I went to an old antique store, it was huge, sprawling, it was an amazing place, and I found a sweets catalog from 1906. And of course I bought it and that, and that, that was one of the very first, if, if not the very first uh, 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 catalogs of industry, of, of construction and building trades where they pulled together all, you know, they had a big problem back in the early 1900s, which was the manufacturers are referring, you know, trying to find their materials and their steel and their heater systems and the radiator pipes and everything in and there's just endless numbers of catalogs well sweets got the good idea to compile them into one thick tome and so this one's from 1906 and i was flipping through there and you can again like reverse engineer forensically front forensically i guess um building methods uh uh, uh tradesmanship um, you can understand how, you know, the technology of the building industry of the time by just looking through that catalog. And we were still building at that time in the early 1900s, we were still building buildings in the old, in, in the old way to a point. Now, at this time, they had steel, they had introduced steel structures like steel lintels over over doorways, instead of brick arches. Right. So if you see an old a picture of an old building where all of the windows are stone arches it suggests that that's pre-steel and so that goes back to an earlier time so if i see uh photos of buildings that burned burned down in seattle with <laughs> masonry walls that are brick three feet thick that that suggests that that is from an industrial era that is pre-1906 sweets catalog and the industry and trades of that time. The other thing it suggests to me, because I've we've had this question, um, like how the hell did they heat these buildings? You know, here in Seattle, it gets pretty dang cold in the winter. Chicago gets even colder. And if you have old mason, you know, masonry buildings with you know, they're just um feet of feet thick of brick and stone, that's gonna just be too, it's like an old castle in Europe. It's gonna be too cold to 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 you know to be livable so how did you heat it how did you heat it and so i've recently um uh come across the idea of these radiant heaters uh and uh, again matt terillion he's he does a fantastic job of putting this stuff out on his channel and his on his patreon account and it and so these radiant heaters were just masterworks of engineering, where with the slightest bits of input, whether coal or wood, um, it would it, they, it would consume every bit of energy of that fuel in a way that there was almost no off gassing at all, and they would radiate heat out as um, it, it would rather than having a fire where the fires kicking you know heat from flames out of a fireplace it would radiate heat out into the mass so now i can see okay now this is starting to make sense where they actually took advantage of having massive walls because if, if to to actually capture the heat capture the radiant heat so the entire building itself would warm up right and now i'm saying oh well rather than being a frigid uninviting inhospitable cold environment in this huge masonry building i can see that being quite pleasant you know if the bricks themselves are holding the heat through this type of radiant technology that we've kind of forgotten about um so it change it starts to change your thinking about the past entirely uh you know this was super advanced stuff yeah yeah it's um yeah e even 
even when I was like, as I first started and I was looking at those cathedrals in, uh, in Florence and you began to see how the energy was going to, how the energy was being pulled mm. down through those towers. And I could, and I could actually see it circulating when I you just sit there long enough and you could kind of tune into it. Those mm. not down the center. I can't, there's, there's like what that's a nave, I think in, in mm. church terms, but it's those, it's those aisles on the, there's always aisles on the side. There's like those, they always have columns that sort of divide it into like three sections. Yeah. And it's like the energy would just, we come down and it turns around the outside. Yeah. It doesn't really go down the middle. It turns around the outside, turns around the outside. And I could then understand, oh, well, they've got that organ behind me. Mm. And once that organ starts to play and you start to put the right musical frequency, then with the swirling energy, it's like, I, I wouldn't doubt that energy would then hit those rose windows mm. and just just explode out to the city. Like an so not only is it generating energy, yeah, not only is it generating energy for the cathedral building itself, it would then explode out to the city. And depending what cymatic pattern you put on top of those rose windows, you could actually then dictate what kind of energy would go out to the city. Right. And then when you flip it around, you would notice that all of the old buildings in Europe, they all have a metal um facings in front of their apartment window like it's like usually half mm. the size of the window and it's it's these metal these these you know uh like look like little um fences they make no sense of why they would be there it's not like it's going to keep anybody from falling out or but if for some reason they act like a like a pulling pattern or an attraction pattern to whatever energy has been sent out. So now the energy gets sent out and it gets somehow attracted to these gates, whatever those gates are made out of. Literally, you could have the whole city. Like if you were sending out like a balancing uh, healing type energy or something, you could have it in the whole city in a matter of minutes because it would literally be every one of these buildings would have, and every apartment would have pulled it in using the, the facings that were outside. And when I began to kind of look at that as a, as a yeah as a technology of what they might have been doing it, it was um yeah it was beyond incredible because certain cathedrals and, and a really good example would be in Nantes France which is on the uh on the east west coast of the of the country there's one more famous cathedral one that had a fire again recently a lot of it burned down but when i was in that one that's the one that has that alchemic box in it I found that the energy there was, I actually got a bit tired when I was in that cathedral, but there was another one, the Cathedral of St. Nicholas, further down in the city. And it didn't matter how tired I was, how uh, maybe frustrated about something I was, or as soon as I went in there and sat down, it was just like gone. Mm. It was like, literally, it was just, it was like whatever junk I was carrying was just like gone. Mm. and I started because it was near the hotel and I started and ended every day there so I started in, in the cathedral and then I made sure that we made it back before it closed so I could go back in and it was like an automatic cleansing procedure and if if that's what they were doing with these buildings and potentially a lot of these other buildings creating these harmonic spaces creating like literally using sacred geometry and mathematics creating a harmonic a certain harmonic frequency you might have been able to stay in in pretty st uh, strong balance and harmony just by going into these buildings and sitting down for a while. Yeah. It, it's a pretty amazing thing to contemplate, but that my experience is telling me that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. And by contrast, modern buildings, I look at them and experience them and they're subtractive. This is the way I look at it. They're, they, they suck energy. They suck resources and they just kind of suck. Um, the 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 amount of energy that it requires to keep a modern building going is astronomical, and so they they you know the, and again being an architect and in the building trades for many years, and they keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter. By by they I mean um, like the zoning officials and the and the, and, and the the building codes. In terms mm -hmm. of you know the the green sustainable movement in the building trades, the the rules are just getting unbearable and and prohibitively expensive for homeowners for builders because everything has to be super insulated and 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 cryogenically sealed against the outside, so there's no inside air that's allowed. Everything has to be mechanically uh, 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 ventilated. There's this reliance upon electric uh, mechanization of just ventilation, just to breathe. 
Um, and then you have the problem with the off gassing of, of these toxic materials inside and on the problems are it's, it's never ending Yeah. versus the, what you just described is additive. Right. Well, you, it's like, well, how did right. they have the resources to build so many cathedrals? Right. How is it that they, it was like, no, no, it was, it was, you know, cost didn't matter. Right. Like they would just build Right. everything was detailed to the nines everything was just so yeah. exquisite and it's like when you start to pull back and look at it the way you just described it's like well it's because the more spires the more energy was actually being tapped into right the more copper domes the more atmospheric energy you could pull down right as above so below you have the pot the the negative ions in the antenna with the positive ions of the earth and you're creating a circuit. And so the more of that that you create, the more actual energy you're tapping into and the, and the more uh, resources are available to the occupants. So it's yeah. a complete 180. It's a complete inversion of how we think about building today. Right. And I, I guess I'm kind of lucky because I had spent, you know, the last, what, back 30 years ago when I was studying ancient sites. So I was whatever little money I had, I was traveling over the world and going to Teotihuacan and going to mm. Palenque and going to places in Egypt and going to Avebury. And so I have, <clears throat> I have the, the uh, memory of what the energy was like at those places. And in some cases they were so strong. It was like my legs would be on fire. They would be burning because of the, those are what was happening. I could, I could Avebury. I can't stand still. I had to keep walking because if I, I thought if I stopped, I would burn up was that strong mm -hmm. so i have those experiences that i could see wow these buildings are not teotihuacan like the cathedrals i mean they're not teotihuacan they're not uh, dashur or sakar but they're close mm -hmm. they're really really close and then you have to start wondering well how are they doing that and uh just as a reminder to see just what you know matthew's talking about there like if uh where, where it was there should be a there it is screen share if i just quickly sh uh, share this so what we're talking about, so there's the, because he was talking about the old Chicago courthouse. So here's the old Chicago, the, the one that they decided they needed to tear down and destroy, right? So this was, this was and built in 1898. And then we have this building, which, uh, or this one over here, I have to kind of move my screen a bit. And that's the new one. There's, there's the modern building. So exactly what you've just said, here's a building that's built to suck energy to distort energy, to, you know, squeeze it, actually. And then you've got this building, which is built to expand it, which is built to, which is built to harmonize what's in there. So just giving people as you can get of like, of, of what we're dealing with. And going back to all the fairs, all of the buildings look are the main buildings, not the not the secondary buildings like um, and this is another thing that I think it's important for pe people to remember is that like if I if we say like, for example, oh, a lot of these buildings were from an old world. They were might have been there from before. We don't mean that whatever whole fair was there, that it's all, you know, the midway was not from the 1700s or a thousand years ago. They actually did build a lot of stuff. And you can see from the photographs that it, it's very simply built. It is built with wood and plaster and and in fact, just down where I live is one of the remaining buildings of the Chicago World's Fair. It's in Orkonger, uh, Norway. It's the Norway building. It was shipped over, stayed at the fair. They moved it somewhere in Wisconsin for a while, and they shipped it back about five or six years ago. Uh, a prefab uh, church is what it was, and then you could just take it down and put it back up. And um, interesting in itself, because it had an energy to it. Mm. Even that building had an energy to it, and I knew it wasn't. And it wasn't an energy from the building. It was an energy from being at the fair. Because what I did is I, I sat with the building for a while. And all of a sudden, I got this feeling of movement. Like like hundreds, thousands of people just moving in front of me. Like They weren't coming in or they're just moving. And when I went and checked the exact location of that building, it was right at the edge of where the uh, state buildings were heading towards the main buildings and where the rest of the midway was. So literally, if you were going almost anywhere on the fairgrounds, you would be crossing this building. So it made sense that there would just be people just moving constantly. So even, even a building like that, that was at the fair, mm -hmm. wasn't one of the original buildings, still itself 
sucked up all of the energy that was there. And I think that's a really, really good example of what we're, what you've just been talking about, that they are, what kind of energy must these events have created? Like, like what kind of energy would that electric tower in Buffalo in 1901 have been creating? Like to me, that that's still that, that's still the most bit, one of the bizarre. When people try to say, "Well, it's it's just a movie set," they just they just put up plaster and pieces of wood. You know, it's just a facade. The Buffalo Electric Tower was two hundred and eighty five feet high, and they had elevators going to the top so people could go up there and take photos of the fair. You're gonna yeah. build something like that out of plaster and and some pieces of wood when you're gonna have a whole bunch of rich people taking elevators to the top. Come on. Yeah, like I mean, it's things like that that should automatically indicate to people we're dealing with some we're dealing with massive construction projects. Yeah, that's the that's the the point I was making before about you know we're kind of offered these off ramps to to just look away from the mystery, and that's one of them that they're just temporary, and it's a big one because, like you said, some of these towers were um, hundreds of feet high. You cannot build that in a temporary fashion out of plywood and staff. You you can't you can't and then have it stand up under earthquake, uh, hurricane, blizzards. You know all of the forces that when we when we engineer any any house any residential house, it's earthquake, snow loads, hurricane forces. Those are the three loads that are applied to it. And when looking at the old world buildings. Often what's neglected is the engineering that goes into it, let, you know, let alone the architecture. Um, these things have stood up for centuries. There, th therefore, they were highly engineered and the people who were building them thought every bit of this through. The, 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 and, and, and so, you know, the same would have to apply to a World Fair building. If you have a tower that's 250 feet high with elevators going to the top of it and balconies around the the dome um you can't you you there, there's just no other way about to go about that to, than to build it for real and the other point just if if we take the it was only a model uh, uh argument to the end just to entertain that um i've made this point before that when when you build well when we used to build our actual physical models before everything was you know 3d renderings when you build a model at an eight, let's say an eighth inch scale, there's a small amount of detail. You're going for massing and you're figuring out how masses work together. And then you blow that up to right. a quarter inch scale. And what I, what I mean is a quarter inch in the model equals a foot in real life. You can f squeeze a lot more detail into that. You can actually see what the windows right. look like. You can tell the wall thicknesses. And then if you blew that up to a half inch, then you're getting to a high level of detail for a model. Half inch of the model is a foot in real life. You actually have to start putting trim pieces in there and 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 like what the components right. of the wall actually are. So when they say these were temporary, what they're suggesting is it was a full scale model. The, the amount of detail that has to go into a full scale model is actually a building. That's a real building right. at that point, especially when you have all the physics yeah. working where you have elevators going to the top of a 250 foot <laughs> tower. So right. that, that whole, now, that whole but, argument. Yeah, now, now, of course, of course, my theory had been my theory had been that they had built um, that they had built like scaled models like you were talking about, you know, right. and probably high scaled That's, models. So you have like mm -hmm. hidden somewhere you have like one model of the whole thing mm -hmm. because. So many of the photographs of the fairs are taken from a high vantage point, which okay. is not where you would normally think the average, especially in the 1890s, would take photos from. Why do you constantly need, how, how would you get up there, a balloon, uh, whatever? What are you going to do to get up high enough to get these photographs, right? Here's, here's they're always tend to be, yeah, this this direction, mm -hmm. which would make sense because that's how you that's how you photograph a lot of models. So again, if you've got three or four real buildings, and then you've, you've got, you can take photographs of those and you'll have real people at those and you'll, and then you just take a few photos of a, of a model pretending like you've got a much bigger thing than you have, get some artists, pencil in some stuff in there and no one would be able to tell the difference. And I get this, I'm starting to get the sense that might be what was happening because that starts to make sense. If you had to build, instead of 700 acres of the Chicago exposition, if you built a hundred acres of it, 
little more plausible and you built 600 other acres as a model, which if you got 5,000 guys, you could do that if they had model skills. Then we start bringing into these architects the question of are they architects first and foremost or are they diorama makers? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I start to wonder if the big the biggest construction project on these fairs weren't these models. Uh, it's just it's it's just a theory now, but it's um it it at least starts to potentially give an answer as how they could do things in such a short period of time. It's, when if if you're awesome. building 70 or you, you can build 70 70 or 100 acres potentially in a couple of years if you're really hard at it mm -hmm. but you're not building 700 acres in, mm -hmm. into you just you just can't it's impossible so either yeah we we what, what's our story either they've been building it for for 50 or 100 years the whole thing is already there or they've got some kind of sneaky way of using the photography at the time and uh, i'll just say this and i'll shut up and let you talk when i got into i took a break after this and i wrote a hockey a hockey origins book a story of the the origin of hockey in the 1880s 1870s and i thought that's a little break from all this stuff i have something nice and relaxing to write about you know mm. and as soon as i got into the story the story made no sense and when i looked at all the photographs of the early players and the early teams of this time they're all like photoshop like every single one is like a doctored photograph and I had to start. And I finally realized, Holy crap, the whole history. And not, again, I thought, well, the history of baseball and the history of football and the history of hockey. Well, that that's fairly truthful. And I realized, no, that's not truthful at all. They were. So if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're uh, altering photographs of hockey teams in the 1880s, why wouldn't they be altering photographs of, the world fairs it would of course they would be is nothing sacred howdy i mean to alter photos of of hockey's history is it's too much <laughs> yeah it's uh it, it, it's it's like bizarre there'll be like these guys that obviously pasted in heads or it's the wrong body on the wrong person and it's just like why are they doing this yeah like and and like you say as soon as you find one as soon as you find one photograph that's not accurate everything starts to come into question because now you're saying something is not truthful. How deep does it go? Well, I think your, your uh, diorama hypothesis is plausible as it's as plausible as any other explanation. Um, and it, but again, it gets into, for me, it's like, well, how is the magician doing his trick? And that to me, it's like, right. I, I just, that's where I just, I, you know, I, I, it starts to hurt my head after a while. And so this is why I've I've uh, embraced this mantra of stones don't lie. It's like, just look at the buildings. Look at what we can see and what we can put our hands on. For instance, the manufacturing, the manufacturer's building in the Chicago World's Fair. And there's some actual photos that show an interior of this massive steel frame structure. Right. Massive. And... I've looked at these photos over and over again, and it's like, obviously, this is not temporary because this is a massive steel frame building with a massive concrete foundation, and that uh, temporary building does not make. And it's covered with a sea of glass. And so you can't, you know, you can, and then it's, I think you uh, cited this. pull a photo up here so people cited this statistic in your book. See like, it while you're. It could fit 300,000 people uh, or something like 140,000 people in it at, uh, uh, at the launch of the fair. Yeah. Okay. So let's. There you go. Let, right. Let's let. So just, just so people know what you're talking about. So this is this is supposed to be the opening day of the of the uh, Chicago Exposition, which had which opened in this case in 1892. But yeah, there you go. So when I look at this building, first of all, it's just I'm let put the temporary thing aside. I'm not even going to entertain oh. it anymore. Now, what was this building if it was already here? And I just, you know, was looking at it. And you you asked the question of uh, well, how did you know for instance, why are they all these photos of the exterior from up, you know, this high vantage point? And I I said, well, airships, perhaps. Mm -hmm. This to me looks like an airship hangar. This building looks like it was used to manufacture airships and was repurposed for a world fair. 
So there's a there's a plausible explanation for this particular building. I mean, 14 acres. What building is 14 acres? Oh, it would no. take you an hour and a half to walk the perimeter of 14 acres. Yeah, there's there's the exterior of it for people. Now, of course, we have the problem because if you notice, all of the flags are flying in different directions. So we're back to this this <laughs> issue. I never of noticed that the flags are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go go through a lot of these photographs. You'll notice that the flags will go three different directions. Mm -hmm. You'll also notice that a lot, just, just first photos come up, you'll notice a lot of these boats, they look uh, penciled in or, or painted in. Those don't look like actual boats. If you could get close enough, you would see that. Um, but this is, a, this is a telling sign. Three Three flags this way, flags go the other way, flags go a different direction there. Yes. It, I don't know if you saw. I'll try to pull that up. I just let me just find that one where I was because it came up. I think when I just did Chicago World's Fair. When I just, uh, it's this picture right here. Uh, this is one that also I think is a telling photo. Which, if you look at this photo closely, I guess I can open it in a new tab so we can just see it. You'll notice that this this boy is penciled in. You can see that's obviously not a photograph of a person. He's he's been drawn in. Mm. And if you look closely, you'll notice they've been drawn in. They've been drawn in. Mm. And once again, you can't really see it in this photograph. But again, you'll notice the flags. Flags go that. Flags are going directly back. They go on a bit of an angle. And if you the other there is a picture that's not this one. That's a little better. The uh, flag at the top of this building goes the third direction. Yeah. So when you start looking photographs like this you're 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 they're doctoring the photographs mm -hmm. they're right out doctoring the photographs so and as well when you look at this building here i think this was the government building i can't know um the uh, illinois building it's actually not this skinny the, the 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 it should be much wider when you see it on the other photographs so it's also like the picture's been squeezed for some reason mm -hmm. but like that's you know that's that's a penciled in image. You can see it especially with the space. And yes, they did Photoshop photos back in the late 1800s. Um, mm -hmm. Mind Unveiled did that fantastic expose showing exactly how they did it, and um, it, it's pretty exhaustive um, and to me conclusive. So they had the technology to for all sorts of montage, you know, photo manipulation, and 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 then it gets to the question of how much of it to what degree um and why uh and then you you know the question is raised is like well that's just an awful lot of work to you know create the illusion and and i i, I would say well it's right. less work to create the illusion than to actually build you know 700 right. acres of buildings in two years yeah <clears throat> yeah and that and that your your comment of that being an airship hangar it was something I can't. I thought of myself. I never put it in the book at the time, but mm. because that seemed to be, or in some case, what those uh, crystal palaces were, that they seemed to be some kind of uh, transportation hubs. Because every city had a crystal palace, right? It, all of a sudden, magically, they all everywhere in the world built one, and then they all burned down. But I never. I, I it was like I kind of thought of it about the manufacturers building, but I. But now that you mention it, that thought has come back again. I think you're hundred percent. That's what that was. That was either an airship facility for building or 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 uh, storing them. It was a giant hangar, and that makes complete sense. Of that's what it was, and so the building, it was already there. Like you say, you just have to refurbish it and turn it into something else. So it wasn't necessarily a an old world dome structure kind of thing, but it was still it was still operating as a. Because it, 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 if I if I remember that building also had the uh, the towers on it too, right? It had it had external towers and mm -hmm. and uh, things on it. So who's to say that building wasn't generating uh, its own energy at yeah. the same at the same time? It's um, yeah. Those crystal palaces make me think of, um, and we still have them. We have one a smaller scale one here in Seattle, Volunteer Park, but these um, botanical conservatories. And they're right. like smaller versions of crystal palaces. And what's so interesting about them, and you can look, uh, just find one in any random city um, on Google Maps. And what 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 you often have is this botanical conservatory crystal building, um, steel frame and, and, and just sheets of glass. And, right. and then across from it, you'll have, oftentimes you'll have a cathedral 
or you'll have some other um, you know building that appears to also have this sort of like telluric quality to it. And then you'll have a body of water right. often yeah. in the middle. And then to one side, you might have something like an octagonal pavilion. And on the other side, you might have something like a water tower. And oftentimes right. it's set up like this. And it's, you know, at, at a point you have to wonder why and ask the question, what is all of this doing? Right. What is it doing? And I, I'd have to say my own experience now, it's, it's generating energy for something. Now, what is it generating the energy for? I, I don't know, but I don't doubt that it is. And I wish there was a, I wish there was a really good uh, meter of, you know, reading energy somehow that you could walk around with to determine these places generate, get higher scales on this meter than somewhere else to kind of like prove it. I can only go by the feel of them, but um, I'm sure it's measurable. They're, they're oh. not. Yeah. Yeah. And because they're, they're not putting that kind of detail that kind of for the things that they're saying the buildings are for you don't need these but you don't need that unbelievable finish mm -hmm. perfection of finish like everything in these buildings just like i guess it's maybe my, my understanding like when i was going through an egyptian temple the first time it was, it was that i already knew that every single thing there was there on purpose. Mm -hmm. There's not one wall carving. There's not one block in the wall. There's not one pillar. There's not one. Nothing is there by accident. It's all in exactly the place it's supposed to be, geometrically where it's supposed to be, energetically where it's supposed to be. It is. It was well thought out in advance, every single piece of it. So when I looked at any of these buildings, it was I could see it as 3,000, 5,000 years down the road, they're doing the same thing just in a different kind of structure, but it's still every single tiny piece is not there by accident. It's all related to one whole. And then, like you say, you can't look at the building separately. It's, well, what's beside it? What's next door to it? What's across from it? Where's where's the water? And when you start realizing all of these things are constructed in a in a in a massive plan, uh, yeah, who's who's planning this? When did they plan it? Why did they plan it? And how old are they? And more interestingly for all of us, how many of them still work? Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And by contrast, we have uh, we have, you know, the the explanations that were given, which are just they're really pathetic. Like, have you ever uh, read the book Pillars of the Earth by Kenneth Follett? No, don't bother. It's interesting story. It's well written, but the way, but but the pillars of the earth. So it's the story of how a cathedral was built, and 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 by extension, the story of how cathedrals were came into being. And supposedly, uh, Mister Follett spent twenty years studying the subject before he felt he had you know enough enough knowledge of the topic to actually write this book of fiction. And and it was like again, a nice story, but what it conveyed was basically cathedrals were uh, stumbled upon as a building type, like flying buttresses were thrown in there because the protagonist found himself up in the arches late at night when he was at the end of his ropes and he noticed cracks in the, in the, in the vault. And so, Oh, we better do something about this. Well, let's, you know, shore it up. And then, you know, Rose window came because his daughter, whose name was Rose was looking up and said, daddy, wouldn't a window be great there? <laughs> And it's like this this is what they give us. This is what they give right. us. And this is why history is is dead. And when they present history in schools and so forth, I've got three boys in public schools. It's tough. It's really tough because they come home and I have to like try to unwind all of that stuff. And it's, you know, it's you know, it's like the Sisyphus syndrome, just pushing rocks up the hill. Um, versus uh history as we're discussing it and as you just you know presented right. it there it's just it's living and it's alive and it's it's exciting and you feel part of it and and and, and it, it it makes you um uh it makes you a better person i mean for one to just see yourself as part of an unfolding of of events and 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 um that these buildings are actually living things um, and I've, I've, for a long time, I've looked at buildings as, as living organisms. I used to, um, I kind of mm. cut my teeth doing remodel 
work. And I, I, I prided myself on going into old buildings, started with the, the turn of the century house that I grew up in, in New Jersey, renovating a room, sanding down old oak floors, you know, uh, repairing plaster and lath walls and, and putting up, you know, trying to match the old oak trim and bringing life into new, in, new life into old spaces. And then I, you know, um, began doing that to entire houses and, and so forth. And so fast forward to now uh, doing this research, and I, I came upon this idea of electric architecture, that buildings like a person, a human, like any animal has an electrical magnetic current. You know, planets have electromagnetic currents, not to get into the planet debate. <laughs> you know, celestial bodies have have telluric toroidal yep. currents. They they have measured scientifically the electromagnetic fields of pyramids, and they have electromagnetic, you know, hyperfocus electromagnetic uh, uh, um, energy bodies. And so, like you mentioned before, could you go around and actually with a, 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 a some device? Yes, you could go and measure the actual electromagnetic field of a building. And um, I think, it, you know, if you have buildings that are built in such a way that like crystals, that they're aligned with the electromagnetic field of the celestial body that it's plugged into, and you as a human and you come in and your, you know, energy is kind of janky and you're a little off kilter because you've been out in the fields or you've been doing whatever, um, fighting with your friends or, you know, uh, you needing some kind of realignment in your life and you come in and you can realign your own electromagnetic field with the building, you know, with the larger celestial body that you're part of. Um, I absolutely, absolutely believe that this is true. And I absolutely believe that this was the function of many of these buildings. Down to the materials themselves, like the materials like granite. Granite uh, has um, <clears throat> quartz crystal. And quartz crystal under right. pressure creates piezoelectric charge. Piezoelectric properties, by the way, can receive signals, which is why a crystal radio works. So you have charge producing quality to the materials under pressure. You have the ability to actually send and receive signals, which is gets into another fascinating aspect of what these buildings were actually capable of doing and what this technology right. really was. You have uh, conductive uh, materials like copper and gold. The Iowa State Building, by the way, is one uh the Iowa State Capitol building, five domes, gilded in gold. Like what, what, what is that? And, and you asked before that, do some of these buildings still work? It's like, like, how do you turn off five gold domes? <laughs> so I was, I was just thinking while you were talking, it would be really interesting to uh, go together to Egypt where you're adding your building construction knowledge and I can take you to certain areas of sites that kind of nobody knows about. And we can look at things that are unexplainable. And at the same time, energy haven't the energetic charge at some of these places is beyond um, explanation. And then there are places in Egypt, like there's a some places at Abu Sir. Uh, site's very hard to get to you, uh, very hard to get onto the site. But what there, what there is, is there are areas, square areas, whether it's limestone on the outside and, the, and it's granite blocks on the inside. It's usually opposite, usually granites on, you know, anyway, granites, granite was on the inside of the, of the walls. The granite is melted. Like ah. the granite is melted, but the, but the limestone is fine. So mm. that means whatever melted, it couldn't have come from outside because it would have melted the softer mm. limestone. Whatever caused the melting happened inside these certain buildings, but it only melted the granite. Yeah. It's like to, to look at things like this and you start to wonder, again, what these things are, what's going on, and more importantly, they're obviously generating energy, energy potentially enough to melt granite. What are we dealing with? 
sounds like a massive plasma discharge of some sort. Either something went haywire or there was some event like the thunderbolts of the gods, right? The the, the plasma discharge and and um so what this makes me think of you you so you said uh limestone on the outside. So that would have been insulated. Right. So the out the out Gr granite on yeah, the, the, the outer right. part of the yeah the granite was on the inside yeah yeah so that would have been conductive the limestone on the outside would have been insulated so the here already you can see that you have some kind of um alignment of materials that would channel um again electromagnetic energy in such a way that if there was some kind of either malfunction or um like plasma discharge event could have right could, you know what other force could be capable of of melting granite um and that to me yeah, gets, i don't know and what's so interesting what, no, what most people don't notice is the is the floors are generally all alabaster uh -huh. alabaster or or like pure crystal so you've got also these these alabaster crystal floors everywhere so it's like every single part of the structure is like a giant energy creation device yeah yeah it's so, so the so the ancients knew this, and they built with these principles right. in mind for eons. And it is only this, you know, from pick a date, eighteen mid eighteen hundreds, or something that the you know the industrial revolution as we know it, and the introduction of modernity has completely inverted all of this. And that, to me, when you mentioned simulation, that to me, that to me is a simulation in, in, in a sense that we've been, our consciousness, um, every bit of our understanding of ourselves, our, our view of the world, our relationship to the divine, all of it has been defined uh, by modernity, by the modern project. And, you know, and you can just, you know, you mentioned the Civil War before and, for that, you know, we can bring in all the the world wars and what were they really doing. And I did a bit of research into the world wars in light of this research. And what I've what I've uh, uh, found found out was that the great powers, a lot of the time were targeting each other's heritage centers. They're like, wow, you blew up my cathedral. I'm going to blow up your cathedrals. And so, you know, after a tit for tat and you have a bunch of destroyed cathedrals, a bunch of destroyed, you know, spiritual centers and heritage centers, um, that's pretty bleak. And that's, you know, that, that again shows the extent to which they're willing to go to unwind, you know, the, the, the old world and, and, and what was here before. Um, and, you know yeah. that that it's so disconcerting for us to like you're big into Plato's cave to walk out of the cave and open our eyes and 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 put up with the the light that's <laughs> all around us um, and try to adjust ourselves to that. That's that to me seems to be the 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 calling of this age that we're in now. The you know the uh. And and yeah, but, maybe it'd only be a maybe, few brave people that are willing and able to actually, you know, um, weather that and and lead the way forward into you know where, wherever whatever direction the great reset is trying to take us is is a non-starter. Um, so you know we have to go the other way. And what a time to be alive, Howdy. Yeah, I was just going to say, what a great, this is a perfect point to kind of wrap up our first conversation. I guarantee you we're going to have more of these, but I, I see the same thing. It's, well, it's, this time is difficult. It's challenging. It's insane. It's, uh, and it's going to get more insane. It's also the greatest opportunity we've had in a long, long time. Yes. There are, there's a door open right now. There's a door open right now for people who want to to want to see things in a more clear, honest way. It's it's there. And a lot of this stuff, I think, is just, it's it's happening now to get people to stop just looking clearly. And that's the first the first step is just, I, I want to know, I really want to know what's going on. I really want to know what this reality is. And I'm willing to just take a good, strong look. And it doesn't matter whether you look at history, whether you look at science, whether you look at religion, whether you look at the economic system, whether you look at yourself, it doesn't matter where you go. You'll find that, if you look honestly, 
what you see is different than what you've been told. And there's your first, oh, that's the first opening of like, and then you have the chance to take that as far as you want to go. Yeah. Yes. So, it's, yeah. It's an open invitation. I, I want to wish you really good luck next week. Uh, I'll mention something when we go off the air here, but just openly here, I just want to wish you good luck. And like I say, I think um, this, this should be the first of more conversations going forward because I get the sense that as we share more and more of our research, we're going to tap into more and more similar things. And yeah, we should, we should do, we should do this again. Wonderful. Howdy. It's, it's heartfelt. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I'm about to go through a portal of, of my own a uh, week from now and uh, I'll come out the other side of it stronger than ever. And just, I'm so excited to um, have this as um, just to anchor um, you know, myself, center myself. And uh, because all of this research, it's not superfluous and it's not extraneous. It's not just this hobby that I have it. I mean, maybe people can hear just from the passion that we bring to it. It's really central and it's really important. And so, yeah, I will, um, this, this has given me a lot of strength and I appreciate it uh, very much. It's an honor to talk to you once again, and I look forward to many more conversations. Yep. This is going to be great. And we'll, we'll go forward and guys, we'll see, we'll see you guys soon. Um, when, when it's ready to go and he's off and running again, we'll be back. We'll be see back. You in a bit. <laughs>